welcome to Deep Impact, a deep dive into Wildbo's most underappreciated work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we're back for Damages 2.3. So uh, Damages 2.2 left Blake and Rose plotting to uh, get back at Laird by basically trying to get him arrested. Um, (laughs) You know, an interesting strategy in a world of magic. They didn't think, oh, let's do some crazy magic on him. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, to be fair, he's a lot better at magic than they are. So going for another angle. It's probably a good yeah, idea. Yeah, but he's, he's also chief of police, so he's a lot better at not getting arrested than they <laughs> yeah. are, too. <laughs> so yeah, I don't fair. know if that, <laughs> if that is a valid defense of their strategy. <laughs> anyway, um, so they basically start this chapter by uh, <laughs> the same way they start most chapters, uh, reading a bunch of books. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to go back and do a tally of how many chapters have started in this library. Uh, yeah, I have a feeling it's it's approaching like fifty percent mid study session. Um, and <laughs> yeah, it's really a lot of books. Uh, so Rose is kind of calling out to Blake what books you know he should read next, um, mm. including a book which I want to call out, which is just a list of practitioner deaths in the area around them. Yeah, when they first brought this up, I was like, wow, that's pretty like fucked up and morbid, even for practitioners to just have a list of like yep. everyone they know of. Uh, or every practitioner they know of that's died uh, in the region. But, um, it, yeah, something something you've sort of written here uh, co- totally makes sense. Like, it, now that we know what ghosts are uh, by the end of the chapter, this would actually be a pretty useful um, thing to have, uh, you know, especially because practitioners are probably right up there on the list of people who are going to die traumatic deaths and leave an imprint. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it really sets the stage for the idea that, like having books that just list off deaths are a useful thing in this universe for some reason. Um, yeah, because at the start I was just like, why? Um, yeah. I-, I love this little Dewey decimal system uh, type thing they've built for knowing where the books are. Like, because Rose is clearly still the front runner of having knowledge. Yeah. And, um, you know, so she can sort of tell Blake what where a book is and like what shelf and he's able to find it. And I guess this is just a little aside, but. I've been thinking for a while now, and this chapter really hammered home for me, how much value someone would get out of digitizing this information. And I mean, I don't <laughs> think that's an avenue Pact is going to explore, uh, which is probably for the best. But mm-hmm. I can just imagine if this was me and I ended up in this house, I'd be trying to like get online so I could go to like Practitionopedia or yep. something. and <laughs> get, get this online, get it indexable, then you can just control F vestiges or whatever the heck you want to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a very old-fashioned way of doing things, but that that kind of fits with what we know, so it it does make sense. Um, So, Rose, (laughs) I like this next bit where Rose basically tries to trick Blake into agreeing to read a book, um, and obviously once he's agreed, he has to do it, and it turns out that this book is so heavy, it's so thick that she can't even lift it, and she was trying to do this kind of, like, loop word loophole thing. Um, It's a really great little prank, and it's also so thematic to them just both trying to get better at being good good at wordplay you know yeah well blake kind of his response to it is he's he's almost half torn between like uh oh, like that's a good one um yeah. and realizing how he almost just got got and like yeah just that that sort of constant dread uh, that's going to now be affiliated with that potential like that avenue so yeah. it was like he he struggled to find the humor in it because of his grander <laughs> situation um yeah, yeah. Um, so it's revealed that Blake and Rose are reading because they're trying to research the potential kickback that they'll get if they execute their fuck with Laird plan, right? Um, mm. So specifically, they're trying to find out, hey, if we do this, is this enough cause for us to get executed or will they not be able to execute us based off of this? Yeah. And, I mean, this is a good thing for them to look into. Like, They're, they're basically yeah. doing research on what are the actual rules on what we can and can't do yeah. that involve witch hunters, which is probably... You know, this would have been useful information to have going into the the council meeting and stuff. So it's it's just generally <laughs> a good idea to be looking this up. I would have been surprised if there was a book that kind of succinctly said, like in Jacob's Bell, here are the things you can and cannot do. Um, yeah. It seems like something that would be quite specific to each area. Yeah, and that just seems too easy. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and to that theme, they don't really find anything, and so they realize they they need help. And they don't have anybody that they can <laughs> ask for help except the lawyers. And so Blake is kind of very reluctant to to call them. But uh, he he 
he kind of concedes that they just don't have any information on this and that it's time to, you know, it's time to make that call. Yeah, well, and, and it's great because it also beats in this sort of this time pressure they're constantly under because they're, they're sort of like, well, the, a normal person would just like wait and be in the area and, and learn through experiencing more council meetings yeah. or they'd be able to ask someone else and trade something for help. But it doesn't really work because everyone wants to kill them and <laughs> yep. they're, they're trying to head work. off a potential execution they think might be coming in a month. So yep. it's like it's just hammering home how isolated and uh, like time sensitive everything is um, as well. Yeah, they really have no... <laughs> they have no no time. Um, yeah. So, the, it listed for the lawyers, there's a phone number for them, or you can just say their name three times to summon them, which is <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> such a fucking funny idea. Like, we'll get into it more this chapter, but the idea of lawyers as these, like, fucking weird demonic things. It's great. It works so well because you get this, like, there's a phone number, and then also saying their name three times, which is such, like, a Bloody Mary horror trope thing that like they're juxtaposed <laughs> so well that it's just hilarious and yeah. sits like because they're already lawyers so there's just this natural <laughs> yeah. pop culture con- like concept that you're not going to trust them and then to find out you summon them by saying their name three times just really adds to this like <laughs> it's I don't just like these such guys. A great <laughs> it's like while well, both thinking hmm lawyers huh well <laughs> How can they're I make supernatural it so what if we actually just make true all the horrible jokes about them <laughs> <laughs> um yes <laughs> so uh before before they call the lawyers though rose kind of explains that she was researching vestiges and found out the about ghosts right a, a classification of others that that is often overlooked and she thinks has a good chance of of you know being available for them to summon and and bond with um yeah well so they're kind of they're they're sort of powerful but usually not powerful enough to be worth it which kind of puts them right in this zone where Blake and Rose might be able to use them because it's something that is presumably handy and hasn't already been claimed, um, yeah. and, but you know, you know, isn't useless. It really is just great, kind of reaffirming the the concept of how how much Blake and Rose need to just fight for scraps. Basically, yeah. <laughs> they're just so outside the system that they this is <laughs> this is kind of all they can afford. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um. So the Blake B and B and R head downstairs, and um, <laughs> we get this really intense scene where Blake slowly repeats the names of the of the law firm three times, and it's building this tension. But nothing happens. He says the name the third time, and he waits, and he thinks, "Hmm, I think as soon as I'm gonna expect that they aren't coming, they're gonna pop up at the door." But they don't. They don't show up. Yeah. It, it's sort of playing off horror movie sort of tropes and expectations yep. like uh and because i mean i i don't watch too many horror movies but the what always gets me is the moment where you're expecting the jump scare and i get so tense expecting it that then it hits me 10 times harder um <laughs> because i'm already tense and and yeah. i feel like that's sort of the vibe wobbo was going for here like he he has blake specifically call out the trope and he's like just waiting for it all to go wrong and so you yeah. sort of tense up and you're like uh and then it, and then he just and then know, nothing yeah. Leaves you leaves you blue. Well, yeah, as Maggie would say. <laughs> but the thing I like about this is this tension kind of fades off pretty quickly, but the next thing that happens is Blake and Rose head off to summon this ghost, but they know that they can't do it inside the house because the house is protected, so they have to head outside. And so mm. this, there's this build-up of tension from saying the names of the lawyers, and it dissipates, but then they head outside, which is like... You know, the story has been saying over and over again, inside good, outside bad. And so oh, yeah. the tension, like, ratchets up, falls away, and then starts to ratchet back up again, just knowing that they have to go outside. Yeah, and so like, as they start this ceremony to summon the ghost, um, Blake's just constantly catching out of the corner of his eye, like, others moving in the periphery <laughs> of the property. And, yeah. And, and, he, and he, uh, you know, like, the words used are things like crawling and stuff, so... It, it really yeah. gives you the sense, like, even though they're only a few steps away from the door, given it's others and, and we're seeing words like crawling that just implies this otherness, um, yeah. it just doesn't feel safe because it's like, well, a few steps might not be enough. Like, you, you don't know. Yeah. At, at one point, Rose even says, like, all right, maybe it's time to run back inside, Blake. They're getting a bit too close. <laughs> it's it's a very tense chapter, which I love. Um, So they draw a kind of salt circle and stand inside it supernatural style and blake calls out to june burleson who's this ghost of woman who died in the 40s that that they found in this ledger of dead people 
Um, yeah. And as he's saying her name, he kind of sees with his second sight a connection forming to her. He says her name again and again, and he kind of draws blood and strengthens the connection, and she appears at the kind of edge of the woods. Yeah, um, she just pops by, says hi. Yeah, she she, <laughs> she pops by. She's like, <laughs> and, and we get this sense for what ghosts are in this world. She's She's a recording, basically playing through animations of her crawling through the snow and yeah. when she needs to make a motion that isn't covered by this kind of static movement she can do she just kind of disappears and reappears <laughs> further ahead um crawling again i i mean i i found this whole scene very visual and it's very reminiscent of the ring um mm. like that's what i was it's just this this woman kind of crawling and like 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 jumping like she's got this weird like frame rate issue basically um yeah yeah it's 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 very visual and creepy as, yeah, as hell yeah you can really picture it you can really picture it um especially like the idea of her crawling uphill but her her kind of she can only <laughs> really crawl forward and so the animation doesn't quite make sense and so suddenly she's just at the top of the hill yeah it's like a bad video game where she's like clipping through the ground um, yeah she's trying to walk up the stairs <laughs> but her feet just walk into them yeah um like blake has real bad lag uh during this scene <laughs> Um, so, uh, moving on, um, <laughs> Blake, basically, tr- we get this scene now of, of Blake trying to make a deal with June, and this is a great scene. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just like, I really love it. It's like, it's just so cool, you know? Like, <laughs> fuck. You know, I love this, I love this book for a lot of reasons, but one of them is just it makes, it takes such a creative look at, at these supernatural tropes. Um, mm, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a great example. So, um, June, you know, Blake tries to talk to June, but but he, she doesn't really seem to respond to him, only really to respond to Rose when Rose says things. And so Blake and Rose kind of tag team this conversation with Rose saying things and Blake being like, oh, no, try this, try this. Um, and Rose kind of yeah. saying that and getting a different reaction. No, I can't help but notice that this is this is one of the first times where they're sort of dealing with something... I mean, I don't want to say human because you know, there's a whole discussion coming up about whether or not uh, she's yep. she's human. Um, yeah. But it's the first time dealing with non practitioners or non just like regular fucky others, and I can't help but notice that Blake's the one who's really in tune. Like, yeah. Almost, like June's problem is a very, uh, or this recording of June, the problem's very real and very human, and yep. that seems to play a lot more into Blake's strength than Rose's. Um, which is interesting. Like Rose seems to take after her grandma a bit in that she seems very competent in this world, but the first time they hit normal people problems, uh, she she kind of freezes up a bit. Yeah. Uh, let's give a bit of the backstory of June so we can talk about that in more depth. Basically, June, yeah. uh, as she approaches Blake, he gets, starts to get really cold before he suddenly starts to get really hot. And June kind of starts sending out these temperature waves alternating between, you know, being freezing cold and like burning hot. And and she's mm. trying to express that she she started to freeze to death before she made it home and fell asleep in front of the fireplace and burned to death and it's like this dichotomy of temperatures and Blake kind of figures out that that doesn't quite add up and uh, recalls that you know when you're freezing to death the last thing you feel is actually warmth and so he kind of puts two and two together and says oh no she didn't actually burn to death she froze to yeah death. Th- that's what that heat is um, and then because it was all based around the reason she was out in the cold was because she had a fight with her husband and she wanted a yep. new husband is basically what she says and so Blake yep. puts two two and two together and realizes what she needs is warmth and basically what she wants is is like a man to hold her and he gets Rose yep. to take advantage of those two two needs by selling himself basically as someone who can provide those yeah it's a bit of a, a weird kind of desperate <laughs> housewives vibe um <laughs> and uh and you know B- Rose says oh Blake will keep you warm Blake will hold you and June kind of accepts this implicit deal and and kind of embodies the hatchet that Blake brought with him, kind of yeah. making a deal. Um, but I think this scene is so cool because, yeah, like you said, this is the first time that Blake really shines in an interaction in this world, right? Yeah. And I think it's because Rose is, Rose is planning. Rose is planning and by the book. And, you know, in this conversation, she's trying to, like, hear what June has to say and listen to her and all these things. Whereas Blake is trying to kind of improv and puzzle it out and kind of come at it from different angles, they they approach it in, in two very different ways. And Blake's yeah. kind of 
<laughs> you know, hopping from one idea to the next style of approaching this conversation is, is really just what, what gets it home. I'd almost say Rose is coming at it, like you said, very by the book, like she's she's read about ghosts and she's thinking about it very sort of practically, whereas Blake sort of goes through and, and actually listens to what she's trying to say, not what she's literally yeah. saying, uh, and yeah. he comes at it from a very emotional point of view, which which is sort of what I was talking about before, where he comes at it from a very human standpoint, and, and that's what ultimately ends up working in this case. Uh, so, you know, Blake yeah. won, Rose... 100 or whatever. <laughs> well, he's, at least he's on the board. Yeah, and, and to kind of support what you're saying, Blake seems very uneasy with the idea of taking what is an apparition of a w- woman in pain and basically using her for power. Um, and Rose yeah. is like, oh, no, she's just, a go- she's, like, she's just a ghost. It's fine. It doesn't matter. She's not really a person. But Bla- <laughs> Blake kind of a bit bluntly makes the point that <laughs> that might also apply to Rose. Yeah, it's... Um- um, it's a pretty good burn. Um, and I mean, because I'm quite yep. torn on this myself, because, um, mm. like, I get that you can say objectively it's just an impression and yep. and all that, but, like, the reason they were able to connect with her was through, like, human emotions and, like, a, a conversation, which just yeah. kind of means that it has some ability to think. And, and now I'm sort of thinking about how this applies to just all the spirits in general, which are kind of animalistic, but, like, mm. um, it, I think it's a bit simple and kind of practitionery to just be like eh, it's not a real person it doesn't count um, yeah oh it's just another we don't have to worry about its feelings yeah yeah no i, I get what you're saying um i think we're going to talk about this idea a bit more later on but yeah. um the chapter ends with with blake kind of heading back inside to try and bind june into the hand uh, the hatchet more permanently so that she doesn't mm. kind of burst out and just freeze everything yeah, and I just I just wanted to point out I love this concept that June went into the hatchet because you know they're sort of talking about firewood or because yeah. it doesn't make the fireplace in the woods so she she sort of went for the hatchet because she wanted something associated with the fire and and manliness and it's a yeah. sort of great simple because you know uh, for that so I thought that was great yeah it's it's very it is it all just ties together so neatly um, but as Blake is looking for a way to inscribe the handle with a sigil to like keep June safe inside it. He sees three young lawyers, or two young lawyers and one older lawyer, waiting in his lounge room, who introduce themselves as Man, Levin, and Lewis, before saying, don't cry in front of us, it'll be embarrassing for you. <laughs> yeah, because well, Blake was just saying he he felt like he was going to cry um, yep. when he thought Rose was the only one there. Now, I'm really excited to see more of these lawyers, as I think one of roughly only four people in the world that enjoyed Angel, the, the TV mm-hmm. show. I'm keen for more supernatural lawyerings. So I'm excited to see where this goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I just think this chapter is very cool. Like, there are a few simple things it does, the the play of tension and, and the the fact that we get, get outside the house and get a, a few touches of really cool, like, world building about a new type of other. All, all these things together just make a really fucking solid chapter, right? It's, yeah. it's awesome. I love it's it. Got, it's got great tension. And, and I love the way yeah. what we do at the start is the chapter opens up and kind of sets up the lawyers as ominous, like we get yeah. you know, the whole summoning them creepily and, <laughs> and just that they're lawyers and, and the whole book's been kind of cramming, uh, cramming into our heads that it's like, uh, you can't really trust them. And then mm. we sort of jump out of it and almost forget them because we deal with this little ghost thing. And so then just as the chapter ends, it, it's just like one step forward, two steps back, just as they have a bit yeah. of a win, uh, suddenly the lawyers are there and you just don't get the sense that it's necessarily a good thing. Yeah, it really feels like, is this a good outcome? I mean, they kind of wanted them to show up, but they're, they're creepy as fuck. Like, yeah, yeah. But, but it's already a bit of a recurring theme in this story that, like, uh, some big threat gets set up, and then Blake and Rose will kind of get distracted by something else that's also kind of bad, and then just as they're sort of okay with how that's gone, they get slammed in, in from behind <laughs> by the original yeah. thing that's worse. It's, it's great. Yeah. No rest for the wicked on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the end of our chapter. That's uh, Damages yeah. 2.3. Going to get into some cool lawyering stuff next chapter, I suppose. I hope, yeah. Mm. Um, but we wanted to, uh, since we got introduced to a new, a new type of other, we wanted to dive into it and talk about ghosts. But that would yeah. probably take a few hours. <laughs> like, that's a <laughs> yeah. big topic. Ghosts, ghosts are everywhere in folklore, so uh, we're going to narrow in a bit and talk about stone tape theory. Mm. So what is stone tape theory, Elliot? 
Uh, so the Stone Tate theory, it's kind of an extension of like psychometric stuff, which psychometric is that uh, belief that like all objects sort of store an idea of their history and, and energy associated with them. So when you see like mm. mediums or clairvoyance on, on like in other movies and TVs or you know sometimes in real life, um, and they say they can like touch things and get a sense for who's owned it and stuff like that's that's all psychometry. Uh, so, sorry, psychometry. Yeah. Uh, and so st- stone tape theory kind of bounces off of that and says that ghosts aren't actually like spirits or souls that attract. They're just like really strong impressions um, of like emotion and stuff that have left like a permanent or, or semi permanent imprint on an object. So yeah. the name stone tape theory is coming from this idea that like a ghost may just be like a recording like on film but on a rock so it's like a rock yeah a rock has yeah. recorded uh this the emotion of a moment which you know is presumably usually a bad one i think the way rose describes it in the chapter is is pretty apt uh, she says this is an emotional event that hit the world hard enough to make a dent shaped like dying of hypothermia <laughs> yeah um, yeah exactly so that's very stone tape um but of course pact pact has sort of extended it a bit and and kind of meets it halfway because obviously what we saw in this chapter was a little bit more than just a recording. Like she, she mm. was able to be negotiated with, and and that kind of lines up with the concept of spirits in general. It seems like nothing in this world is just flat. Everything has some form of consciousness, um, which is great. But it, it definitely seems like the stone tape theory is is the direction that Pact mm. has leaned in in general compared to most ghost stories uh, in the modern day. Yeah, the thing I like about the stone tape theory is it's it's this very cool. It feels like a very cool way of people wanting to find a scientific way for ghosts to be real. Um, yeah. So the the term stone tape has been around for like 40 years or so, but the idea dates back more than that. There was this, uh, back in 1837, Charles Babbage, famous mm. computer guy, <laughs> uh, wrote about- Look, you can't, like, hit the, you can't hit the net every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some, some, some ideas have to be a miss, I guess. <laughs> um, no, but it's this idea. He, he wrote about how words leave kind of impressions in the air, right? Yeah. And, and reading about that, it's very easy to imagine people thinking, oh, you know, we're learning about this new world of particles that are invisible to us and sound is an actual thing that travels through the air. Like, it's not that much of a leap to imagine human beings and their actions, you know, rippling out through particles like i move my arm and the air moves away from it right yeah and that's a physical effect and so if that's a physical effect maybe there's a way to reverse that and get from the impact that i have on the world to kind of replay my actions and then from there it's a very short step to well dead people have left an impact and we can you know yeah. display that impact by playing it back um yeah yeah it, it's funny because wikipedia also, like, like I went to the Wikipedia things on um, psychometry and and stone tape just to just to read up on them, and Wikipedia specifically has sections on both of those pages to explain why there's no scientific evidence for either <laughs> of these things, as if that needed to be clarified, um, or is that just what you know they would mm. say? Um, That's just what they want you to think, Elliot. <laughs> yeah, I think the idea of of stone tape ghosts is very interesting. You know. Um, yeah, it is. And, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing what other stone tape ghosts we see in Pact, I suppose. <laughs> Me too. Um, but that's the end of our episode for today. Uh, make sure you join us in three days on the 28th of January for Damages 2.4, when maybe there'll be some lawyer things happening. No spoilies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if if remembering the 28th is too hard for you, uh, you could just subscribe to Deep Impact, uh, you know, and google play itunes stitcher uh you know wherever you wherever you like to get your podcasts yep we have a twitter that you can follow to see when all our episodes come out as well as our website media md podcast which has links to do all of those things i just mentioned but also well there's you know we've got a discussion thread as well so if uh, if you want to talk about stone tape ghosts or any kind of ghosts or even just packed stuff in general it doesn't have to be specifically ghost related although that you know helps um <laughs> Then check out the discussion thread linked in the show notes below, and you can uh, we can all chat together about what's going on. Yeah, I think that's everything, Elliot. Man. Yeah. Do you ever think you know, like we're kind of stone tape ghosts in the way that our podcasts are leaving our impression on the world, and then after we're dead, people can use these podcasts to you know bring us back to life in some form. I think in in two hundred years, when stone tape theory has all that scientific evidence, Wikipedia is claiming yeah. it doesn't have. 
everyone's going to make fun of us for making fun of it. Well, to be honest, we probably should have invested our effort just like scratching podcasts into stone and then, you know, (laughs) they'll be able to play it back in the future. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We'll ride the new media wave. Anyway, that's that's (laughs) us for this episode. (laughs) See you in a few days. See ya.